Hi, I'm Dan Lewis from uh, uh, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan in the United States. Uh, uh, I spent uh, a good section of my career as a college professor at William Tyndale College and I am currently the senior pastor of Troy Christian Chapel in Troy, Michigan. It's a pleasure to be with you for these lectures. This series of lectures is an introduction to the Bible. It's not uh, about the content of the Bible, so I'm not going to talk about the stories of the Bible or the theology of the Bible, but rather it's about the Bible as a book. And in this series of lectures, we will look at things like the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, we will talk about the languages of the Bible, uh, the translation of the Bible, uh, a bit on the history of the English Bible. Something about the theories of translation. Uh, we'll also talk about the canons of the Old and the New Testaments, uh, and then conclude uh, with some reflections about that. This first lecture is on the inspiration of the Bible. The answer to the question, how did the Bible come to us, must be answered on two levels. Uh, one level is theological, and the other level is historical. But theologically, Christians believe that the Bible is the ult or that, that God is the ultimate author of the Bible. And in this, God either reveals or motivates the content of the Bible to humans by directing their research, by directing their minds and their spirits and their hearts, and in the case uh, of them compiling information, of uh, assisting them and inspiring them to compile it so that the message of the gospel comes across in clear color. This claim, of course, is a claim of faith. Theologically, we cannot prove the uh, inspiration of the Bible in the sense that we can demonstrate a historical fact. So this is an item for Christian faith. But then there is the historical side of the Bible, and in fact we can trace that according to the normal processes by which we look at any historical process. Uh, so we can look at text, we can look at the transmission of text, we can look at the translation of text, and how the Bible has come to us in that way. The three important terms that we want to talk about at this point, one of them is the term revelation, one is the term inspiration, and one is the term authority. All three of these terms significantly frame what we think about the Bible as Christians. Revelation is the divine disclosure of what was unknown and what in most cases could not be known other than that God himself revealed it. God revealed himself directly to humans. He revealed himself to Moses, he revealed himself to Abraham, he revealed himself to the prophets, and he also revealed himself in his acts of history. For instance, he is the moving force behind the exodus from Egypt, and it is God who directs that. It is God who allows the Israelites to go into exile uh, to Babylon and uh, to relocate uh, in the ancient city of Persia. God also provided a record and an interpretation of these events. So even though historically you can look at an event like the exile in which the people of God are invaded in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, their king Jehoiakim and many of their citizens are exiled a thousand miles to the east of Babylon, that fact uh, is historically demonstrable because of ancient texts. But the idea that God led them this way, that God in fact allowed for the exile to happen as a judgment upon his people is something that is part of Revelation. Men and women of the Bible spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Scripture says. So Christians believe that the Scripture is revealed by God, and they believe in progressive revelation, which is to say that later revelation is built upon previous revelation. It is uh, a progressive kind of thing in which one kind of revelation that comes to us through Moses is then built upon by the prophets, and then later the message of the prophets is built upon by the message of Jesus. Inspiration, the second of these three important words, says that the Bible is written by humans under the special influence of the Spirit of God. In 2 Timothy, Paul says that uh, the scripture is inspired, and the, the, the term that he uses there in the Greek text is a term that means God breathed, or that God actually enabled them to speak the words that they spoke and to write the words that they wrote. And so when the biblical writers speak, God himself speaks. 
And so it's appropriate then to say that the Bible is the word of God in the words of humans. Now, a couple of key words describe the extent of biblical inspiration. One of them is the word verbal. The other is the word plenary. When we say that the Bible is verbally inspired, we mean that the Bible consists of words. And in fact, we also mean that we believe human language is adequate to express what God intended. Perhaps some people would suggest that human language is not adequate, but the biblical writers don't take that viewpoint. They take the viewpoint that God's word and human words are compatible to the extent that humans can express what God intended to express. A belief in verbal inspiration is against the idea that the Bible only gives general insights. The idea that the Bible is just some sort of a general religious work. Rather, the actual words of the Bible are things that God breathed into the author's hearts and minds as they wrote. The word plenary, on the other hand, means that the Bible is inspired in all of its parts. Plenary has to do with the whole of the Bible, and all parts of the Bible are equally inspired. All parts of the Bible may not be equally important or central. For instance, the message of the cross is probably more important or more central than the story of Esther. But the Gospels, which talk about the death of Jesus, and the story of Esther, or the story of uh, Jonah, or the story of the Israelites uh, in the kingdom of Solomon, all of these are equally inspired in the sense that all of them are part of the whole, and the whole Bible stands inspired in that sense. Inspiration did not cancel out human personalities, and in fact, it is quite apparent that human authors of the Bible have characteristics of their writing, they have certain ways of expressing things. Uh, St. Paul in the New Testament is given to what is called genitive constructions in the Greek text, and he uses them a lot. Uh, other writers are more simple. John's writings in the New Testament, the, the sentence structure is really quite simple. Uh, and the same can be said of writers in the Hebrew text. Not only does their writing express something about their personality, but sometimes these writers use pre-existing sources. In many cases, these sources are named, especially in parts of the Old Testament. The most frequently named sources in the Old Testament are the archives of the kings of Israel and the archives of the kings of Judah. And the material in those archives are brought together in what we call First and Second Kings. Occasionally, the biblical writers might even quote uh, writers or thinkers that are not part of Scripture. Paul, for instance, uh, quotes uh, the poet Menander. Uh, on another occasion, he quotes the poet Aratus. And uh, on another occasion, he quotes the poet Epimenides. All three of these are poets from the Greco-Roman world, and none of them were Christians, at least so far as we know. Uh, but nonetheless, Paul thought that they had a word of truth that was valuable in expressing God's truth. And so sometimes they may quote from things like that. Biblical writers might even inject their own human emotions into the writing. Paul writes to the Galatians, for instance, and he says, I am shocked that you are so quickly moving away from the gospel you received. That sort of statement obviously shows human emotion. So often in the writings of the New Testament or the writings of the Old Testament, there are strong feelings that are expressed. These kinds of emotions in no way detract from the fact that the scriptures are inspired. They simply go back to the basic statement that this is the word of God in the words of human. Now, if the Bible is the word of God in the words of humans, then it is God's word and it bears the highest possible authority because God vouches for it. Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. And so the Bible determines what is true and right in a religious context as opposed to what is not true and what is not right. And it is in this sense, therefore, that we believe that the Bible is the word of God. This is the end of the first lecture.